Thank you very much, Pete, Cash, and Mike, for the uh, video. Uh, in my X-ray which I put up, uh, it was a valgus knee, and there are two parts of the questions. The first part was, could this knee be done through a PS or a CR knee, or it did not make a difference? Uh, the, for that, I'm very clear. I'm philosophically a true and complete PS surgeon, so I would use a PS knee. The question would be that, therefore, because there's a deformity, could a CR surgeon use a CR knee? The answer is yes. There are many fantastic CR surgeons who would be able to tackle this with a CR knee. But the point or the message remains very clear from my side that both a PS surgeon and a CR surgeon have to get the balancing perfect. It is wrong decision making to jump from a CR to a PS only because you feel your balance is not perfect or you feel there's no stability to the knee. That's a wrong decision making. Let's move to the second part, which is the question I asked is, do you anticipate problems with exposure? And I asked, what are the three problems you anticipate with exposure? Uh, for this, I'd like to start that when I tackle complex knees, I divide the, this into four main big categories. One of those big categories is exposure. The second big category, which is beyond the remit of what I'm going to talk about today. But just to let you know, I ask myself, is there bone loss and where is the bone loss? The third big heading is that once I've tackled the bone loss or recreated the bone loss, and I do my trial reduction, is there a need of more constraint? In other words, what is the integrity of the collaterals? Do I need more constraint? And the fourth big heading is that in the proximal femur, or proximal to my knee replacement, or in the tibia, is there any previous fracture? Is there any deformity? Is there any osteotomy? Is there any obstruction by metalwork, which will impede me doing my normal I am jigging for my femur or my extra middle jigging for my tibia? So that, those are the, my four big headings. So for this, I will stay to what is the problem with exposure. So in exposure, the first issue is scars. And for this, in my question, I asked, what scars do you anticipate or what is the issue? So the patient said that many years ago, 40 years ago, she had a, probably a lateral meniscectomy. So the first question I asked myself is, yes, there's a scar in the knee. Can this scar be incorporated into my longitudinal scar or not. If it can be incorporated, however many years ago it is, I incorporate it. If it cannot be incorporated, then I stay away from it. And what I definitely don't want is I don't want to have what is called as an apex issue of the scar. So I don't want my fresh new scar to intersect and form an apex with the previous scar. So that's something which is I don't want because the necrosis happens in that triangular area. So that's the message. If you have multiple scars, then which one should you use? The traditional teaching is use the lateral most scar. The way to remember it is that remember the common approach to knee is a medial parapetella approach, but the skin incision, if you have multiple scars, will be the lateral one. So the opposite of what you think. Now we come down to the second question in this knee scenario for exposure is what other problem do I anticipate? Now remember I said that somewhere down the line, 20 years ago, she had another operation for a patella issue. Now she could have had two things. It could have been a lateral release, which was commonly done about 20 years ago, or more worryingly for me, even though there are not telltale signs of any metalwork in the vicinity of the patella tendon, she could have had work done in the patella tendon area, for example, a split of the patella tendon with rerouting. All this makes me worry about two things. One, there'll be a lot of scarring in that area, and therefore mobilization and eversion of my patella would be difficult. But more importantly, I need to be very careful that I don't take off the patella tendon from its incision on the tibial tuberosity because of the previous scarring. So all this gives me information to be careful. And the third question is asked was what third problem would you uh, anticipate? And that would be the problem of obesity. Is obesity an issue? Yes, you just have to take more time. It's not an issue because with the exposure I do, I do get it uh, without much of a struggle. Uh, it's harder work. 
and the patients are grateful. But you have to once again, the message would be delicate handling of the uh, tissues. So these are the three problems in the exposure opening the knee. Uh, sticking to exposure, what other problems can I anticipate? It could be mul multiple scars or burns, unlikely, but any scarring or tethering of the skin would be a problem of exposure. Obesity I've already talked about. And now I subdivide my second part of the problem of uh, exposure is yes, I've tackled exposure, I've gone into the knee, uh, but how what will I do that once I've implanted the knee, would there be two issues? The first issue is, would there be any issue with patella maltracking? So in other words, would I have to do a lateral release? And the second issue, as I ask myself, is once I've implanted my knee, would there be a, a extensive mechanism being the cause of my reduced range of movement? So I repeat again, I'm not talking about a tight knee or not getting a good bend because of osteophytes. I'm asking myself a very valid question. Is once I've implanted my knee, would the extensive mechanism be the cause of my decreased flexion and should I do anything about it? So let's tackle the first one, which is the patella lateral uh, release or patella maltracking. Now for that, uh, very clear that if you have to do a lateral release, the problem is not on your patella. The problem is that your femoral rotation in your tibial rotation has not been perfect. I'm not saying I don't do it. It's very uncommon. But if I do a lateral release, I really ask my question is the fundamental issue has been your track which you've laid down. And the track which you've laid down is your femur and the tibia. And that has to be right. And then you get a patella track in the right. This concept of trying to adjust your patella button to help patella tracking is wrong. Like I mentioned again, your track is the most important determinant of how your patella will track. And so that's for my uh, the patella. I just want to mention in a very uh, in a knee which has got uh, uh, a near bony ankylosis. Once again, that's the knee where you would struggle or you would have a problem with exposure. But once again, the, the steps would remain exactly like I would do. I sometimes may use an osteotome to get the planes between the bones and then go for my uh, ultimate flexion of the knee and proceed, and proceed with it. So, uh, the, and the last question was, would you use a stem on the implant? My indication for stem is very clear. The minute I need any augment to put on a knee, due to me having to increase the surface area of the construct to avoid any loosening at the bone implant interface, I use a stem. Now in this case, it's a valgus knee. You should anticipate that the area of bone loss would be posterior lateral on the femoral condyle. Okay, so it's posterior lateral. Most of the time, all you need to do is keep your jig when you're sizing it off the lateral femoral condyle to get a rotation right. But if there's a large defect there, which it was in this case, then I use an augment on the posterior lateral femoral condyle. And because of my principle that I used augment, I will always stem it. So yes, I stemmed the femur. The tibia did not need any augment and therefore I did not stem the tibia. Did I need any more constraint? And I want you to understand there's a complete difference between constraint and stem. Stem is just used without having influence and constraint. In this case, no, I do not need any more constraint. So I just use my conventional PS knee with a stem on the femur, with augment on the, on the femur, and that's what I did. So thank you very much.